I suppose that time is the most remarkable dimension within which we live throughout our daily experiences in this world. Time vanishes into eternity and beyond the life we live now there will only be occasional embodiments within time dimensions but these can become very important and uh, necessary to the part of the universal plan to which we belong. The human being has responsibility. Time measures opportunity. All opportunities that come to us in this life come within time patterns. But every opportunity has its own responsibility. The complete picture of an embodiment is an opportunity with responsibility. We are here for a purpose. We are not born simply to wander around in a chaos for a few years and disappear. There is a reason we are here. Most persons are not aware of this reason and are therefore constantly in conflict with the plan to which they belong and of which they are a part. Therefore it is proper and important for us to recognize that this life is an opportunity with a price on it. We are here to grow. Now to most persons growth sounds rather unpleasant. We, have a, we are inclined to think of growth as a problem of burdens, of duties, and of frustrations. To many persons this entire mortal life is a frustration. They see no reason for their own existence and no justice in what happens to them. These folks make life very hard for themselves and contribute to the misfortunes of others. It is wiser to realize that every time we come into this world, we come in to learn. We come to grow and to understand, and most of all, to unfold the internal potentials of our own natures. We have no real idea of what is locked inside of ourselves. We know that occasionally a genius arises and is remembered by others as a person of superb talents or abilities. But if you look at the whole world with four and a half billion people, you finally come to the realization that the human potential is limitless. We not only have a special power within ourselves, but we share the power of all other living things. Therefore, there is no limit to the unfoldment of ourselves if we wish to make a project of growing. More likely, we make a project of complaining. And born into this world under the present conditions, there seems to be a just reason for complaint. The powers administering our material society are not aware either of their own destiny or the purpose for anything else. They live within a very narrow concept of material existence. The world as it is today measures people in terms of time allotments at five dollars an hour or fifty dollars an hour or a thousand dollars an hour. We work according to time patterns. When we can no longer fulfill those labors, we retire and then for a time enjoy or suffer from social security. <laughs> Actually, the individual sort of drifts through this world. He works as much as he has to. He creates debts which he has to pay. 
He raises a family which he has to educate, and he is bound to a pattern of specialized abilities which he will remain with as long as he lives. He will work so many hours every day. He will complain largely of the fact that his abilities are not recognized, that he is not appreciated, and very often in the family circle that he is not understood. All of these situations constitute the pressures of living. To escape from these pressures, he develops certain side aptitudes. Probably the most important one at the present time is the ability to sit for hours in front of a television set. Anyone who can do this really has a tremendous amount of something, but it is not intelligence. Actually, we have escapes. We escape from the problems of life by viewing imitation replicas of them on the entertainment level. We follow the sports. We try to keep up with the news, but are rather baffled. And at the end of the day, we fall into bed and wait for time to pass so that we can start another day just the same. Now, if this was the real reason for life, there would be abundant reason to suspect that the materialist is right. There is no purpose in anything. But actually, the materialist is unable to prove his point because he is talking about something that is alive. He is talking about a being that has within itself a vast diversity of abilities, of attitudes, a being capable of education, capable of achievement in many fields, perhaps a potential musician or artist. We do not know what is in this being, but we know that it has come here, that it is partly developed, that it has some abilities and many debilities, that it seems to be going nowhere, but it is moving forever along the road of time. Time is the measure of its duration in this dimension of existence. Some people are suspecting that there is a real purpose for life and that by one cause or another this purpose is being frustrated every day. Also it becomes obvious that many persons who might have had a valid purpose have been frustrated by circumstances and forced to join the others in a comparatively meaningless existence. Realizing these things, it seems that those who really wish to prove that life is significant must take hold of their own abilities, take hold of their own natures, and try to release or develop talents and capacities and dimensions of consciousness which will enrich their lives. Problems come for apparently one primary reason. They must be solved. And the solving of problem is one way in which the internal of the human being is released into manifestation. If there were no problems, we would probably sit back in a condition of perpetual inertia. We are forced to meet circumstances. We are forced to devise ways of achieving a certain measure of comfort or security. We are constantly challenged to grow, and the rewards of life are largely reserved for those who have grown in one way or another, sometimes only economic growth or skills, but they have their rewards. And a well-lived life has a large reward if we can achieve this level of insight. Let us assume for a moment that the human being really has four levels of achievement open to him. He is not just one creature. He is a compound. He has within himself a number of un identified but identifiable 
elements of potentials. The human being is, first of all, in our understanding, a physical creature. He has a body. Now, the body itself is a mystery that has never been solved. We work with it continuously, we study it constantly, but we still do not understand it. But we are gradually coming to realize something that's important, and that is that this body, this physical body, has laws and rules of its own. And if we break the rules of the physical necessities of life, we are chastised appropriately. The body has laws, it has demands and requirements, and it also has a certain tendency to regard itself as the younger child of something else. The body is a small child in a family of which the mind and the heart are the parents. Each body looks to its own leaders for safety, for help, and for the maintenance of the various functions and faculties and powers which manifest through it. Therefore, our first consideration, therefore, is the responsibility of the body, a responsibility that is given to us when we are born. This responsibility tells us one very simple truth. Take good care of the body and it will care for you. Abuse it and you will lose it. Now many people do not think through cause and effect that far. The result is we have great numbers of persons every day who are committing an involuntary suicide. They are constantly and not knowingly and intentionally violating the laws of the body. Among these, of course, are the alcoholics, the narcotics addicts, and those who do variously dissipate away the health with which they have been naturally endowed. So the individual with a body for which he is responsible has to learn to discipline his relationships with that body. He can view it as a child growing up under his care. Most children require a certain amount of discipline, and it is necessary for him to discipline the body. Normally, the body would probably rather well discipline itself, but placed in a false environment and surrounded by temptations with which it is not familiar, the body gets into difficulties. So we have to develop nutritional factors. We have to uh, const uh, constitute our bodies according to rules of health. We have to, therefore, put a certain control over the fulfillment of bodily appetites. We have to take care of the rugged side of its physical efficiency. We have to nourish it adequately. We have to protect it in all ways that we can from emergencies, accidents, and disasters. One of the problems that we have with the body, of course, today is nutrition. The nutritional factor with the body, of course, is almost entirely chemical. Nutrition has to do with getting the proper food to the body. This in itself is a rather complicated uh, procedure because opinions on the subject of nutrition are numerous and diversified. Probably in the long run, most persons have to work it out by trial and error until they find what is good for them. But one thing is obvious, namely, that there are junk foods. And these junk foods are for the most part the kinds we like the best. We've had long experience in enjoying the uh, pleasures of the dinner table. And we do not like to be frustrated into some kind of a diet that tastes as though we were living on new mown hay most of the time. This requires control. But obviously, junk food is a problem with the body. And we have to gradually wake up to the importance of keeping it nourished properly. This is one of the uses that we have to make of our time allotments. If we wish to be as healthy as possible through the years of life, we must discipline ourselves in the controlling 
of physical appetites. Now the next level above this, which we consider constantly, is the emotional life of the individual. The emotional life is the life of art, music, affection, friendship, and the more intimate and kindly relationships of life. The emotional life is fulfilled through the expression of various high moral and emotional qualities. It is expressed through love, love. It is expressed through service and compassion. But the emotional nature must be trained just as surely as the physical. Those false stimulations to emotion which create only tension and stress are like the junk foods in relation to the physical body. The emotions must be nourished upon a proper type of nutrition. The individual's emotions should be given adequate expression under discipline. They should, these emotions should be centered upon creativity, understanding, sympathy, compassion, and service. Every individual should have some emotional expression of the beautiful. Every once in a while we find someone who succeeds in living the entire lifespan with practically no emotional reactions. They have met very few friends and they lose the ones they have. They live alone even if they are in the houses with others. They have no reaction to the simple joys or beauties or insights of life. They have very little fun for humor and joy are emotional factors. And the individual who considers that the good life is the life that is forlorn, miserable, introverted, and separated from society is making a serious mistake. The, the actual suppression of man's appreciation for beauty is desperately detrimental. The individual who has not a warmth within himself, a natural kindliness, who does not realize the importance of curbing the unkind word because it hurts. The individual with proper normal emotions does not want to hurt any living thing. There is sympathy, there is compassion, there is self-forgetfulness, and there is freedom from this tremendous egocentricity in which the individual thinks only of himself. So the emotions call upon our attention and demand recognition. Now, to use these emotions in daily life takes very little more time than denying them expression. The simple emotions of human relationships are proper and appropriate to the need of the individual. But where too much criticism comes in, there is too much personal ambition, where there is envy or jealousy, or where the individual is simply unable to f forgive wrongs or get over slights, difficulties, where this arises, the emotional nature is in trouble. This trouble can extend all the way along the road of life. It can begin in early childhood and continue till we drop into the grave. The appearance, therefore, of these tendencies should be recognized as one of the things we are here to overcome, transmute, and change. <coughs> if we want to know why we are here, the first thing we may learn is to be able to control properly the very body we inhabit. The second thing we are here to do is to control and direct and rationalize the emotional life to make it beautiful. It costs no more to be kindly than it costs to be critical. In fact, far less. Kindliness has many rewards. Criticism has numerous penalties. So we have to go to work and realize that one of the things we're here to do is to clarify, purify, and redirect our emotional resources. So that you turn on something that is constructive, and if there's nothing constructive, turn it off and read a good book. 
the problem of trying to entertain your way along the path of life so that thousands of hours of opportunity are wasted in front of a box. This is not the fulfillment of the life for which we were created, nor is it the proper use of the time allotment which we have. So the emotions search for the beautiful. They try to create artistry in every field of life, in clothing, in furnishing of a home, in selection of ornamentations, in the building of public structures. Everywhere, beauty is an important dimension and a tremendously powerful, if intangible, ingredient in the compound. So everywhere we can and in every way we can, we should live beautifully. Simply, the most beautiful of all things are simple. But we, with dignity, with internal uh, gentility of life, so that our entire relationship has a certain politeness, as Emerson would say, a condition in which we do everything graciously and try in every way possible to avoid the brusque or the critical or that which is asymmetrical. If we could make a diagram of our emotional lives, in some cases those diagrams would be remarkable in every sense of the word. They would be every shape you can think of, every color you can imagine, and with every disproportion that can possibly be combined. But gradually these things can be straightened out until the unfoldment of the natural love of the beautiful becomes a major part of our living in this world. We are here to unfold not only the skills of life, but the gentleness of life. We are here to gain insights and appreciations into things that are not commercial or are not limited within the commercial pattern of our daily experience. Now the mental life also becomes now a point of important focus. It is very necessary to discipline our own thinking because in many instances our thoughts are little more than a continuing pageantry of discomforts and discords of one kind or another. Thinking, the mind, is here in order that we may experience and gain insights into the whole study and life of mankind. It is the mind that gives us the memory of our own lives and the memory of the world's life. It is the mind that supports science, it supports all the different discoveries that are made. It is essential to the advancement of progress in every field of activity. It is also something you have to live with yourself every day. Now the mind can get into bad habits, it can take on a diet of junk foods also. Uh, in which uh, the thinking produces nothing. And every waste of mental energy is a loss to the person. It is doing something to make his stay here less good for him, less desirable for those around him. Looking over the world today, the tendency to be critical, disillusioned, or even frightened to death is strong. But actually, it is the power and right of the mind to discover the validity of existence as it is. We may not like it. We may know there's something wrong with it. But we must know that it is, that it exists. And it will continue to exist as it is until something changes it. And the thing that has to change it is ourselves. There is nothing wrong with the world that the human being cannot change if he so wills. But up to the present time, the will to change for the better has been restricted to a small group of persons. It may be for some time restricted, but if it is, it's still the right of every person who has a life to live uh, to gradually correct mistakes even if they are socially not uh, considered wrong. If he is aware of a better way of life than those around him, it becomes his duty to live it. 
Thus the mind becomes in many ways the ruler of the material world in which we live. It administers all the rules, it creates all the laws, it signs all the treaties and documents. It also shows us the long story of our own growth through time, revealed clearly the mistakes we have made, and would inspire us not to make them again. But a mind that having seen all the mistakes of the past continues to make them personally in his own life is not learning from the life that has been given to him. He is not improving. He is not using his time allotment. He is wasting time failing to change his own attitudes and drifting further and further into the morass with which we are afflicted today. So we have these levels and all of these levels have to be worked out within the time dimension. We have a certain number of years to work as far and as continuously as we can in the direction we want to go. Now there is another dimension which becomes also very vital to us. Out of the confusion of the body and we wonder why we should inhibit it, the emotions we wonder why we should try to change them. The thoughts we are perfectly certain are correct and need no help, but we are in trouble all the time. But above these is another dimension, which is experienced abstractly, but is still very important. It is that dimension within ourselves that comes the nearest to timelessness, and that is man's spiritual nature. Behind the mind there is something else. And even today, materialists are beginning to suspect it very clearly. There is within and behind the individual a pattern of incentives. The individual will not do better until he believes that better can be done. And he will not probably put much energy behind doing anything well unless he realizes that there is a reason for doing it well and that there is a power in nature that judges all things and rewards action according to its own merits. So gradually the person seeking better orientation and better use of his privileges and opportunities becomes aware of an overpower, an over-self in the universe, an over-self in his own compound. This overpower is a spiritual directive. He is reminded in one way or another that the power of deity created him. The power of deity fashioned the universe in which he exists. The power of deity ordained the purpose for human existence. And that purpose was to fulfill the will of deity and become, in a sense, like God, knowing good and evil. So the spiritual overtone becomes the basis of consolation. It gives reason and purpose. It gives courage in times of discouragement. It gives con a definite consecration uh, to principles and to the divine plan of things. The nature of that plan, the purpose of it, and the administration of it, these have descended to us in the sacred books of the world. Every nation has had a scripture, either in the form of a book or an oral tradition, in which the will of the creating power is explored as far as the, creator, the creature, creature can trace it. He cannot trace it all the way. But he becomes gradually aware that there is a reality behind life. He begins to sense why it is important for him to try to be a greater person. He begins to realize that his destiny involves the development of a divine power within himself or the release of God through his own nature. He becomes in a sense a cathedral builder for he is constantly building a house for an visible power which rules all things. The human being is here to come to the direct experience of the divine purpose. 
He is here to find the one consolation that can carry on through all eternity, and that's the consolation of the power of God to perfect him, him and all other creatures. So faith becomes a very important soul power and becomes more or less an ornament to the entire compound of man's nature. And it is, in a sense, the duty of faith to discover the reason for the mind, the emotions, and the body. It is faith that can direct them all. It is faith that can redeem the individual from the curiosities and misconceptions which have burdened him for so long. So time has to do with all these things. Time is the opportunity, the span for the ripening of reality in the individual. It is that part of his own place in space in which he is here to do the job he came to do. Now very few people know what that job is and they may never find out in this life. The only way they can approach it, as most thoughtful persons have approached these things, they can say, I don't, do not know what the job is. But if I do not fail in any of my ordinary labors, I probably have done the job. Because whatever it is, it is within the scope of normalcy. It requires no strangeness, no peculiar uh, self deceit or no uh, suffering for the sake of doing the job. It is when we do the wrong thing that we get into trouble. Now time is interesting in another way. The time is a kind of orienting factor. Times are constantly changing. The great unrolling pageantry of time from the beginning of somewhere in space to the end somewhere in God this tremendous pageantry is not known to us exactly. It is partly evident through the great mysteries of the cosmos. It is partly revealed to us through the various arts and sciences, particularly mathematics. It is also to a degree made known to us in our own small pattern of life. But for the most part, we gain a moral insight from, from history. Now history is a wonderful way of showing to us the p actual purpose behind life. The average person cannot fully justify his own uh, ideals, but if he is uh, fairly well uh, equipped historically, he can see why he should do the right thing. He can realize the mistakes and what has caused them and what has come from them. From history, he can find out what is wrong with his political world, with his social world. He can discover the causes of war. He can realize the, ca the causes and tragedies of poverty. He can understand the misuse of power and authority. And also he can understand a little more clearly those constant groups of people who seemingly learn nothing and pass out of this life no better than when they came in. These kinds he can be careful not to imitate. There's no reason why anyone should come to the end of life, his lifespan, without some sense of achievement. I know many people, I've been in a good many rooms when death came, most of whom regret something. They wish they'd been more kind. They wish they had a few more years so they could live them more wisely. They wish they had searched to, to develop greater happiness or greater insights and had not been buried in professions or trades or in economic patterns that were unbreakable. Very few people, as you know, pass on fully convinced that they have achieved as far as they could what they were here for. But those who do pass along with a greater sense of peace and a greater sense of integrity do th look back upon the kindliness that they have shown, 
The sacrifices that they have made for others are suddenly more than worthwhile. They keep to themselves everything they gave. They lose from themselves everything they kept. This type of feeling comes near the end. It comes when the individual in a flash more or less relives his own life. And this life is simply a span of existence in time. He has been in time before, he will be in time again. But now he is slipping out of time. And the problem is to estimate the value of the life that he lived here. Now when we come to trying to work out some kind of a plan for all this, we come against a certain number of inevitable obstacles. The individual feels himself to be pretty well captured in a pattern which he can do very little about. He finds that he must earn time. He must work so many hours to have so many hours for himself. If he works faithfully for eight hours, he may have a few hours every day to do as he pleases. Sometimes uh, what he pleases uh, is comparatively trivial. Sometimes it's important. But outside of the working hours and the hours necessary for sleep and rest, there are hours that are at the disposal of the person. He has paid well for those hours. He has gone through maybe 16 years of schooling in order to get the job which pays him a living wage and gives him a few hours every day to do what he pleases with. Now this allotment has been expensive, more expensive than we realize. It has taken the best of our energies and will do so through our working years. But in all instances, what are we trying to do? We are giving of ourselves and from ourselves in order to gain a little time. We want time to do things that we want to do. An employment is a thing we have to have. The leisure represents a privilege to select some kind of specialized activity. Due to the constant progress of various industrial, economical, mechanical uh, statutes and uh, structures, we are given more time than we used to get. In the old days when man worked from six in the morning to six at night, time was a great more precious thing if he got any of it. Today we have many vacations and holidays and we have comparatively short working hours and it's a very bad life now that does not have two or three hours a day to do as it pleases. We can do almost anything we want to do with this time that we have so carefully purchased. We might say that on the basis of comparison, if our working hours uh, bring an income of $10 an hour, it, to gain those three or four hours of special privileges is costing us from 40 to $60 a day. And for that, we have bought something. We have bought the right to do what we please for a time. For a limited period, we can be ourselves. Now, what do we do with this very valuable and expensive product for which we are sacrificing life and limb and which we have to use within the line uh, boundaries of the present embodiment. What are we going to do with this precious freedom that we have bought by hours, months, years of monotony? Well, this is a question. What are we going to do with it? And people find the most ingenious and often nonsensical ways of spending it. They uh, can do nothing. This is considered to be the supreme achievement. I know many people who believe firmly that if they do absolutely nothing and are waited on by others, then they are supremely happy. They do not realize that it is the person who waits on them that gets the soul growth, not themselves. 
Others feel that uh, one thing they do not want to do with this time is face any responsibility. Everything must be easy. Others find that this time is very happily spent in a beauty parlor, uh, along with further funds. Also, we find people who have all kinds of hobbies, all kinds of interests. Some find travel what interests them. Others find the building of a little machine shop in the back is a great happiness. Some want to spend the time on the telephone. This is especially true of adolescents who practically live on them. But what do we really do with time? Here we have something which has within it the potential of the infinite unfoldment of ourselves. In the leisure time is the time when we can be ourselves. We can do whatever we feel is right and best. We can escape from the burdens and uh, deprivations of employment, and for a few hours every day, we can really be the person we want to be. That is, of course, if there's a person we want to be. Perhaps we do not feel this need at all, so we come home, flop down in front of the television, and wait for the next ball game. This is what we do. But what does this mean in the life of the person? If this was the only life, and we're going to oblivion when it ends, it wouldn't make any difference where we spend our leisure time. It wouldn't make any difference how little discipline we assert. The disciplined and the undisciplined will lie down together in eternal forgetfulness. But if this is not it, and there seems to be a, quite a possibility that it isn't, then what are we really doing with time? Are we making something out of it? And I think each person should, for their own sake and the sake of their associates, sit down and carefully note the time factor to find out what they can do with time which is going to make them more able, uh, more intelligent, more understanding than the condition they are in at the moment. How are we going to dis discover this? Well, one of the things that you always get thrown at you when you try to start such a conversation is that the individual is tired. They've worked. They do not want to be part of a program of further labor. They do not want to consider leisure as labor opportunity. They want to rest. They want to have fun. They want to engage in small talk and very possibly take on a little more alcohol than is good for them. So the idea of planning and discipline leisure, uh, disciplining leisure is for the most part resented. The person feels that he has bought the time to do exactly what he pleases. The only difficulty with this is that a dedication in this, of this type when carried into practice does not seem to work. The individual does not have the happiness he hopes for. He does not find his family as understanding and cooperative as they might be. He finds the programs on TV getting worse all the time. He gets no real satisfaction out of not planning a purposed existence. Now, how do we best gain uh, that which we lack? When those who have these problems should set them up and catalog them properly. They should ask themselves a number of very simple but direct questions as to what makes them happy, uh, how they wish they could spend the time if they could do anything they wanted to, what they are anxious to become more than what they are, and how they are going to face a future that is going to close in on them relentlessly. There has to be something in the form of a plan to make life really valuable. And without value, life is a sort of drifting from the cradle to the grave. There is really no purpose in it. And the history of the world and the present condition of society 
both indicate clearly that the average person does not purpose his own existence. He depends on outside influences. He can be worked into a frenzy uh, by a tyrant. He can buy things he can't use and doesn't need. He can demand luxuries that are not necessary and many of them are detrimental to him. He just goes around doing what he pleases, ending sometimes in a premature grave and sometimes in an involuntary bankruptcy. Out of all this, the time is wasted. We have lost approximately 25 years of life. It's not all in one place. It is scattered through. But if a 75-year life has span, only about one-third can be said to be available to the average person as time for himself. The other two-thirds go to work and sleep. But this third that belongs to him is a magnificent opportunity for a career. The person has a paid initiation into the best schooling. He has the right and privilege of learning almost anything he wants. And if he wishes to want only that which is best, he will find that his economic situation may improve through less ambition and less extravagance, and he can really have a very important extra life that is now lost. He can have an, another complete existence. Instead of being a working man for eight hours, and then a sleeping man for eight hours, he can also be a growing person for eight other hours of every day growing up into new aptitudes and opportunities. So, what are the opportunities today? Probably one of the best forms of growth that we can uh, work with now is cooperation and service to each other. The individual finds perhaps the greatest basic joy that there is in the human composition when he brings joy or releases joy through other persons. One of the simplest things we can do is to plan a program of helpfulness, a program of not thinking about ourselves, but earning the respect, admiration, confidence, and affection of other people. It is something to look back quietly upon a good deed that has brought security to another. And this type of, of backward looking is probably the most cheerful as possible. So service to others. If you do not know what to do, help someone in desperate trouble. Forget being uh, deprived of a few hours of television uh, or being uh, requested to turn away from some ordinary leisure that you have planned, but try to see what you can do to help other people. Now, if you have special trained abilities in these matters, there are many opportunities that open themselves to the person who really wants to help. If you have music as a background and have the abilities, find some young people who want music and cannot afford it. And instead of sitting around gossiping or answering phone calls, take these young people and try to educate them or help them in their musical lessons. If you are in business, take young people who need business training. They will not get proper training in school, but they can get it from someone who has been through it and knows what is right and knows what should occur and what should not occur. Everyone can do something, and out of the best they have done themselves, share with another. Then there are things you can do for yourself. If you are not in a position or do not feel equipped to work with other people, then work with yourself. Develop those faculties and powers which are not functioning properly today. 
look over your own life and see what your mind is doing. Is your mind growing? Or is it just heaping up one prejudice on top of another? Watch your thoughts and see whether or not you are instinctively criticizing things you do not understand or have developed powerful prejudices which interfere with justice and judgment. Look over your own nature and then go to work on the problem that uh, you find needs attention. It is not good, however, to try to simply convert yourself. To sit down and say, I shouldn't hold that attitude is usually not very meaningful. What you really should do if you dislike a certain condition is get into that condition yourself. Move in on it and find out why people think the way they do. Instead of criticizing from some uh, set point within yourself, find out why other people are not more successful in their judgments. I know a number of persons who have simply gone into various walks of life which are not their own in order to find out how other people really live. And it is almost certainly an eye-opener. If you do not wish to go through all this, it then is the best attitude you can have is to believe firmly that every individual is doing the best he can for what he is. And it is always important to try to estimate what he is and help him to become better. You have to sometimes study what we are and find out why it isn't satisfactory and then start to fill in the areas uh, where we are deficient. Nature tells us from experience that each one of us should have at least three and probably four dynamic interests. These interests are not in conflict unless we put them in conflict. Realities are never in conflict. They simply absorb more and more time, but with judgment and control they can be properly allotted. First of all, everyone should have a physical regime of some kind. The idea of jogging around the block, however, is becoming a little too dangerous these days. And it is much better simply to have a proper period, short period of physical exercise and be watchful of the health of the body through diet, through uh, not abusing medications and things of this type. You have a little pattern there to set aside a few minutes a day to make sure that this very useful creature that carries us about has proper attention and care. On the other hand, we must sometimes get the, this creature over the problem of being utterly spoiled, in which every desire, every craving, every appetite is dynamically fulfilled regardless of cost. This type of attitude will probably result in a short and discomfortable lifetime. Having done this and worked out that, then we can go to the emotional nature. We should have an outlet. If we have art or music, this becomes an outlet. And a little time every day should be devoted to it. If we are not skilled, then the study of art can become very important. The appreciation of art. Uh, beautiful books on art are valuable. And also art carries us almost inevitably towards the recognition of the dynamics of beauty. The dynamics of beauty also tell us that attitudes are beautiful or not beautiful. Words spoken beautify or deform. Um, modern art is largely a matter of deformities. Modern music is a matter of deformities. But we have grown so accustomed to it that we assume that these deformities are normal. They are not. Deformity, asymmetry, discords are not ever normal. They are the natural results that arise, however, in lives that are themselves not normal. In art also we find poetry. We find all kinds of appreciations for beauty in every field. We also feel the importance of the art of living, to live graciously, to live kindly, uh, to endure everything that we can 
to maintain the essential, simple dignity of a human being. The moment we lose temper, we are destructive. The moment we do not transform or transmute suffering into soul power, we begin to become neurotic. Beauty is something that we must all have. A beautiful picture on the wall, sometimes. A beautiful view out of the window. And if these things are denied us, whatever beauty we can build in the intimate associations in which we exist, there's always the possibility of tuning in some good music on a radio. There are pro programs on art, on humanities, that do come through on some of these uh, ra uh, television stations, especially the public service stations. All these things can give us pleasure with growth. But whenever we settle down for a long, nice, long evening of murder, we're in trouble. <laughs> we are sickening ourselves. It's just as though we were slowly taking a poisonous dope. After a while, we reach a point where without a murder, the show is too slow. We demand crime. And of course, the thing that we are all self-deceived by is that we are seeing fabrications and artificial things that are conjured up for audience appeal and are assuming that the world is like the abnormalities we see. Certainly, you may find traces of any uh, degenerate influence somewhere in society, but to have it thrown at us day after day certainly disillusions and destroys the integrities which we must build if we want to be good people, successful people. If all else fails, get a good book. Do something that will give you inspiration instead of closing in and making you feel more and more the hopelessness and futility of personal growth. Everything should have some kind of meaning. Another very important point on this level is friendship. Now, friendship today is a very hard thing to have. Most people do not find friendship easy. They are imposed upon. Their friends are too demanding. Their friends are selfish and self-centered. And the individual finds gradually that he is hurt or more than helped by contact with society. One thing to do, though, if you find this happening in your own life, take another look and make sure that you are not aggravating other people. Make sure that your own attitudes are not such that other people can't take them any longer. If your great joy in life is to criticize and condemn something, you're likely to gradually drift into a state of loneliness because people looking to friendship look for one thing more than anything else, and that is proof of the essential kindliness and goodness of human nature. They may fail you, that is their problem. But when you fail them, it is your problem. And everyone should try to so live and think that they can be happy and pleasant and constructive with people who do not exactly agree with them. We should be happy to know that people are trying and doing things, and we shouldn't try to dominate them and make them do only what we want them to. So uh, friendship is very vital, and a small group of congenial persons can make a great difference in life. <coughs> now, in the older group, where we have retirement problems, friendships can be very vital to the happiness of the older person who wants to share, perhaps, the experiences of his own life with those around him. The best and happiest oldsters are the ones who can look back with a quiet joy upon the simple things of life, which were hard when they happened, some of them, but now they are gradually turning into a roseate rem a remembrance, a kindly realization that things were pretty good. Of course, wherever this type of thing comes along, a sense of humor is very necessary. The individual who is too serious about life to have a sense of humor is always in trouble. 
because actually humor is not however ridiculing other people humor is simply the recognition of the delightful mistakes that we all make and uh, which can become very very valuable as an outlet humor is a form of hysteria which relaxes the nervous system without damage <laughs> the uh, uh, problems then go back finally to the in mind, mind level again the mind level has all kinds of interests and preferences and for many people mental recreation uh, becomes difficult these days because of the inconsistencies of society probably one of the best ways to uh, develop a, a better mental relationship with life is to take some field of activity and specialize it uh, there are all kinds of things that uh, people can do mentally to enrich their lives and perhaps help other people very often an avocational literary career can be developed in which the person finds either in his own life or in the lives of those around him interesting episodes and incidents which he can share with other people another form of that is continuing education uh, if the person uh, is interested in any subject of importance adult educational opportunities are probably available and these educational opportunities help to fill in or enrich the mind on some phase of life pick something which perhaps you have always felt uh, wasn't right you've always thought that uh, that particular field was either worthless or actually contributing to some form of mistake and take a course in it and see what happens you will find that very few people intentionally or consciously take up lines of activities which they think are no good they take up something that they feel they can use or is going to be useful to others if an outsider standing on the side of the uh, line does not realize what makes other people better or makes them think more wisely or more kindly or more uh, thoughtfully again there are other types of uh, exercises and lessons that have uh, only very good mental opportunity building one is language very few people have as full a control of language as they ought to have and many have no interest or no background in foreign languages if the uh, older person has leisure a foreign language will help or to complete an education that has been interrupted by the processes of living may bring great satisfaction there's almost nothing you can take up from engineering and surveying uh, to barbering or something of this nature that will not do better for you than watching a TV show you will learn something and to learn is to use time for some constructive purpose and is some skill perhaps very often persons will find as they go along that if they had a certain kind of knowledge their affairs would run more smoothly this therefore as adults they can take the courses study the subject or read at home and gradually familiarize themselves with these subjects which have been difficult or unsatisfactory up to the moment also of course the uh, educational field offers a secondary career in many instances the individual who works at a certain type of job can at another time go out and take a scouting troop into the uh, as a scoutmaster or can become associated with youth rehabilitation projects or can join a, a useful and uh, civically oriented fraternal or uh, luncheon organization he can find things to do in which he will share with other people useful activities it used to be that things of this kind were more or less considered to be men's activities but today probably the average woman needs them more than the man does because she needs to experience a world which has been previously dominated largely by male thinking and she is now working into that field to take her proper place in it 
Therefore, everything educational, everything that will strengthen her contributions to society is far more important to her than small talk or just routine procedures. Everyone should try to find ways to be bigger than they are so that they can do a better job than they are doing. And uh, this is really a joy in the last analysis. There is something very wonderful in having done it right and having everyone else know you did it right. This is an experience not enough of us have. And then, and also on the mental level, uh, we have the uh, creation and inventive side of life. Uh, people can begin at any time in life to take up an art or a science and do whatever time permits them to do while in this particular embodiment. I knew a young man many years ago who was so delicate and so infirm, the doctor said he'd never live to maturity. Then when he finally got a little older, they said, well, it's no use training him in anything. He'll never live to fill the job, even if we give it to him. And he drifted along this way till he was about 50 years old. He was still alive and nothing to do and no background for any type of accomplishment. He finally got completely bored with himself. He took up a science in this case a part of a biological structure it took about five years to get the education he wanted in it and he became distinguished in his field and at 80 was still going strong <laughs> but he found finally that this not doing anything or it's too late or too soon or you're too weak or you're too much involved in other things is an illusion the thing is if you have the incentive and the intention you can do it and this it takes your life and puts it in your own hands instead of leaving it in the keeping of the neighborhood. Another point then comes to the religious matter. Religion is so vitally important that time devoted to it is very useful. But there's one problem that I have observed in connection with religion, and that is that if it is not properly understood, it can be the world's champion time waster. There is nothing that is a greater waste of time than theological argument. And, there are no, and it is also pretty much a waste of time for the average individual to walk out of society to some isolated mountaintop and commune with God for the rest of his life. This does not do any good to anybody. Religion, like every other form of knowledge, must contribute. It must strengthen. It has nothing to do with avoiding and evading life. It is not also the idea that by having some grand and wonderful concept of what is going to happen in infinity, we can go on and be nothing now. This is a common fault in many religious organizations. They retire into groups of their own kind, very small or practically isolated, they spend all their time trying to study some system of theology. They try to meditate themselves into nirvana and neglect all the common responsibilities of living. And it is in this that they fail. The purpose of our being here is not to be physically here and mentally somewhere else. The purpose of being here is to learn the lessons that are here. Religion becomes a wonderful help in time of trouble. It is a background inspiration all the time. It also helps to strengthen morality and ethics. It gives us the strength to keep the Ten Commandments. And it gives us the internal moral quality which enables us to appreciate the Sermon on the Mount. Religion as a tremendous overtone of integrities is wonderful and highly important. But the individual who wishes to consider religion to be his labor should take a very firm look at himself and see what religion is actually doing for him or to him. If religion is making him more useful, if it is making the family closer, if the religious person is a better father, better mother, better child, that is fine. But if it is simply a series of intellectual allegiances and everybody remains the same as far as conduct is concerned, we are not getting very far. I, years ago, I attended a meeting of superannuated clergymen uh, who had a long background of clerical service. 
and they were a lovely, present, dedicated group of men, most in their 70s or their early 80s, who had a certain smug uh, sense of achievement. They felt that they had given their lives for a cause, and they counted the converts they'd brought to God. But one of them in the corner, a little man with a kind of a wry look on his face, it was kind of not quite sure of the rest. He was also, I think if I remember, a Protestant bishop in one of the larger churches. And finally he whispered to me, he said, You know, I did the same thing. I was an evangelist. I went and, con and had me re revival meetings, many of them in small communities. He said, We had thousands of them walking down the sawdust path every time I was there. But he said, I had to come back every year because they relapsed up into 12 months. <laughs> After 12 months, they forgot all about it. So this is the problem with this type of thing. A conversion is something people get over very quickly, for the most part. But a dedication that is experienced within the self can be a tremendous thing if it is a dedication to service if it is a dedication to unselfish giving. Uh, I remember the older ministers used to go to a small town and uh, uh, maybe they got $50 a month if they were lucky. More likely they got $25 a month and a few groceries. Uh, they worked their whole lifetime with people who had very little and whose uh, mental IQ was by no means prodigious. But they had lives of service. They worked there, they labored every day with those people. And they set an example of unselfish dedication. And their example was many times more important than their sermons. But when you get into a situation today where the minister expects $50,000 a year and $25,000 expense account, where he wants to live in a fine home with a swimming pool and things of this nature, the old dedication to the service of people has gotten pretty weak in, in many localities. It is now a profession and a business, a career, not a dedication. So uh, the uh, study of religion in the life of the person, whether he intends to go into the ministry or not, the religious life is one of dedications, of self-sacrifice for the service of that which we believe to be the noblest of all things, the glory of God and the security and salvation of our brother creatures. To uh, work with these problems is fine, but to, the real answer is always in religion. Don't retire into it. Rather, use it, to allow it to come through you to serve other people. The great sermon is the good life. And if we are able to achieve that, we achieve everything. So a little ways along the way, we try to find answers to what makes time a wonderful t opportunity. An opportunity to grow and to be and to become that which we were intended to be. We can never outgrow our own potential. It is greater than we can ever fathom. Because if we trace deep enough into ourselves, we find God there. We find that everything is flowing from a great spiritual source. Aquinas says in his discussion that man has been given a limited intellectual individuality. That he has been made capable of doing what is right and also failing to do what is right. The reason why this determinism is of the greatest importance is there can be no virtue unless it is a decision. There can be no true right without the realization of that which is not right. Therefore, the individual cannot do everything he pleases or anything that he pleases. He must do those things which his own capacities make possible. He has the right of choice free will is the right of choice. He can choose the better or fail to choose the better. If he chooses the better, the power of choice gives him growth. Or as the Oriental would say, good karma. If his choice is for that which is not the best, 
then the experience gives him punishment and pain and is also karma. Each person has the inevitable and eternal right to grow, to use the potentials that have been given to him, to make his own decisions about character and life. And the degree that he makes these decisions wisely, he grows. And at the end of a po an appointed span of 80 years, 75 years, or whatever it may be, he goes forth and nature says that he is a good and faithful servant. The infinite accepts the good into itself as part of itself. And each of us in our own way must make decisions. And the times of the decisions is the leisure time. It's when we can sit down and think things through. It is gradually building a career around a conviction. And whatever that conviction is, once we have it set up, we should keep it. And we will find that keeping it in the long run improves health, saves money, uh, prevents wasted time, and prevents the individual indoctrinating himself in falsehoods and things that are of no value to himself or anyone else. So each one in his own way has to use up time. And the best way to use it is to almost forget it exists because we are so busy doing things that are important for each other when we no longer really remember that we are working with time we are probably using it the best because we are then saying to ourselves I know I have I can't I haven't got much more time left for this and then hurrying up a little to get more done anyway we have to uh, really find a proper use for every potential we have. Every thought that we have comes from a thinking power, every emotion from a great feeling power. Every thought can lead to wisdom. Every emotion can lead to wisdom and also uh, to affection and uh, understanding. Every physical condition leads to the improvement or debility of the body. And over all of this is the incentive. Why should we do these things? Why should we try? Why should we uh, aspire to being better? The answer is that through a religious experience, religious enlightenment, and through the contemplation of the universal plan of things as it has been given to us in the great scriptures of the world, we become aware of the strong reason why we should grow we realize that it's not just a little de decision of our own, that actually the problem of growing better every day is a fulfillment of a purpose, and that we must fulfill this purpose. And failure to do it now simply projects the problem into the future. Nothing is ever solved except by achieving solution. So in our time, we should be friendly, we should be loving, we should take care of the responsibilities. We should build firm homes. We should be honest in our trades and make weights and measures. We should have a good deal of fun along the way, good friends, kindly associates, and we should live in a world which we are making increasingly beautiful by the simple process of releasing beauty through ourselves. We may do this in spite of the difficulties of world times. In fact, the evil pressures of society make it more important that we find the roots and centers within our own nature. The condition of the world today as we find it is a tremendous constructive pressure to the individual to become a better person, to stand for the principles he believes, to work cheerfully in the presence of the discouragements of those around him do never compromise or falter in the realization that in the great plan of things all things work together for good. We can help them to achieve that good. We can discover it in ourselves and in this way every hour of the day becomes an important element in the unfoldment of the divine plan through ourselves. Well, I guess that's all. Thank <laughs> you.